so we've titled this talk for some reason. Um, I think this is a reflection of where we are and, and kind of how we got here. Um, we see what we like and we like what we see. And I think we are increasingly interested in working with algorithmic categorization, um, something we've been interested in for quite a while, um, talked about for quite a while, but it's becoming more important in our work. Um, how people choose things and how they get offered things based on what they've already chosen. And we end up in this kind of cycle of, um, of the same, I think. Yeah. And I think for us, our practice, I don't know, maybe it seems like it is like that for some people, but for us, it doesn't feel like that. So um, we are obviously a collaboration. Um, we work together. Um, I mean, at the moment, when we, we have, well, we've only worked together for the last um, maybe seven or eight years. Um, and a few years ago, we came across this quote by um, Gary Janosko, who was uh, writing about Felix Guitari. Um, and it really struck a chord with us when we were putting this talk together. We, it's like we remember, not often I remember a quote, actually, but <laughs> no. remembered this. Um, interdisciplinary activities are indelibly stamped with the paradox of the between, allowing them to be valorized from an already established disciplinary perspective. It's exciting places to visit and extend one's core work. And so we, we are trying really hard to work in a transdisciplinary way um but there's a possibility that or inevitability that we will remain interdisciplinary and only try things as a novel a novelty is not the quite the right word but it's a goal of ours to try to be truly transdisciplinary in yeah our so practice. yeah so transdisciplinary suggesting that you have managed to find that kind of uh true i guess middle ground um and the idea that interdisciplinary means that you are kind of uh reaching into other disciplines but really kind of fixed within your own so we're kind of constantly that's sort of a thing that's really important to us that we are um really trying to to break into these other disciplines within our practice so but yeah are we inevitably interdisciplinary um what does that mean for our practice this is something um this is something our latest categorization so this is what um how buzz magazine referenced us in a uh, an article that they wrote um maybe a couple of a couple of months ago and trancing 90 style <laughs> techno which is uh i'm not quite sure how to take that really. no um but it is interesting that they felt the need to um so easily categorize us um categorize i mean in this case it was music that we were playing and, and um performing as part of um the electric soup in cardiff um but i'm not sure that's what we were playing really um it was kind of the easy categorization that they chose even by putting mashing those things together trancy 90s style techno without describing what we were doing they've just used a mashup of existing categories to try to describe something because maybe it wasn't quite any of those things and so that becomes fascinating for us because this this idea of categorization yeah. is what we are trying to get between and almost being constantly pulled back within them um and what does that mean for us when we oh, are? Places. Oh, it's part of being an artist, isn't it? <laughs> I like to see. Oh, I, I like to hide my face. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we are part of uh, all of these things. And these things are what we are. We are not individual things. We're not in a category. Um we exist as a kind of multiplicity of all of this stuff. And, and hopefully our practice is a kind of, is a reflection of that. Um, yeah, I guess kind of challenging uh, what is expected, what's traditionally expected and just, just kind of 
um maybe small ways of doing that so maybe like not showing your face on a zoom talk because that's what's expected so um i think often we will try quite playful ways to disrupt something that is uh, maybe um kind of expected and that's part of the way that we work and um what we do okay. so what we're going to do we're going to just go through some of our previous projects so some of you will know some of this some of you won't um some of it's new some of it's old it's kind of chronological um but not quite we did play with the idea of just randomly putting them in um but they are kind of chronological so this is a piece of work that we did in 2014 um with mission gallery for civic uh it was supposed to be in the gallery itself, but we ended up doing a piece of work that went through the city. Um, it's called a cowboy in Tomorrowland. I suppose at that point we were starting to get interested in this idea of what should be where it is and how it should work. Um, a cowboy in Tomorrowland refers to um, a moment when uh, Walt Disney was in the original Disneyland in California and he saw uh, a cowboy from Frontierland walking through Tomorrowland and um, vowed that when he built his next land, which he did in Florida, that he wouldn't let that happen again. Um, and that all of the people, so he built um, what he called Utilidors, which is basically a network of tunnels that run underneath Disney World, so that he would never that would never happen again. So a person would never appear in a in a time or place that they shouldn't be or that they didn't belong. Yeah. So to protect the illusion that he was creating, he needed to make sure that everything kind of worked as it should and everything should be in its place for so, that to work. Yeah. So a cowboy in Tomorrowland was a like a 40 minute walk around audio walk around Swansea, which we used um uh like radio headphones. We carried a, a soundtrack in our backpack. I'd quite like to do this now with better technology, actually. It's quite it was basically seven years ago. We made it like out of sellotape, I think. <laughs> um, but it, it was about looking at the soundtrack, really made you look at the city in a different way. It, uh, we went down alleys when the noises that you heard were maybe coming from above you or behind you, and they related to where you were, but they weren't quite what you were looking at. And so it was about... Um, representing those things that you understand that have been you can see around you and, and maybe getting people to think about them in a different way okay um so in 2016 we were lucky enough to um spend a month in uh, on a residency in venice um again with with mission gallery and linked to civic um and we were at the uh, Casa de Hospitalita in um, in San Alvise, which is in uh, north east Venice. Um, and we were so Casa de Hospitalita is a homeless shelter in Venice, uh, specifically for people from Venice or people who have um, like a historical link to the city. Um, and it's a male only uh, residence up in it, some beautiful grounds really up, up, up there. Um, and we were working really with the, what they call the residents of that house in response to the, um, the architecture Biennale, which was on at the time. Um, and specifically within the Biennale, uh, the British Pavilion, which kind of, which was all about the home. So the, um, the theme of the Biennale at that, for that year was uh, reporting from the front line. And the British Pavilion was um, all about the home as the front line of everything. And the kind of idealized, idealized vision of the home is kind of futuristic, kind yeah. of relaxing space. Like, um, like all of the mod cons, I guess. Yeah, it? Um, all the mod cons and kind of, out. I mean, it, you know, it was interesting. But it was real, um, the, the difference between that and the people that we were sharing this home with, who were obviously um, without any home apart from, I mean, they had this place now, but they'd been homeless for a long time. Um, it was kind of perverse in a way. It was this kind of really expensive, um, flashy show of money and wealth of a country while these people were 
essentially homeless as if that didn't happen anywhere else so obviously that is a thing that's happening all around the world in Britain as yeah, much as th- is in Venice I think it almost made us feel a little bit embarrassed um to be there uh with kind of with all of that grandiose stuff going on and then the sort of the simplicity of where we were staying um so yeah the the response to that was um well was so was gonna, this yeah uh, I'm gonna start fl- let so that should start flicking through so um we wrote a book um, based on the stories of the a few of the residents in the uh, casa, um, and we really wanted to give um, a degree of importance to some of the places that they that were important to them uh, in an architectural sense. And so that um, ranged from um, like that one is it's just a, a ledge next to a bridge on one of the canals. Someone else sat here at a place that he sat on, on the lagoon and watched people go by. Um, another one at a bench that he used to sleep on. Um, and we, we spoke to them really kind of weirdly, actually, because we don't speak any Italian and they don't speak much English. So um, this kind of fragmented conversation with them about their lives and their these places that were very important to them. Um, and we went out and photographed and measured, so did some architectural sketches, measured up those places in a way that an architect might afford to um, someone else's home. Yeah. Um, and I suppose this was us writing mm. uh, for the first time. Um, and then we talk about being transdisciplinary, I suppose. This, kind, this book was a bit of a mishmash of all of those things, from drawing to... Um, being responsive and site responsive and uh, participatory to to us having to write or feeling that we needed to write these stories down. And so there's a kind of fictional narrative that's based. Yeah, so Calvino kind of inspired yeah. um, and written in that kind of way. Um, but yeah, just so much to it. So um, just having having written that kind of in that kind of poetic language, I guess, and then. Mm-hmm just the, the length of time that it took to get that translated with someone who can speak Phoenician and the importance that he wanted to give it so that it was correctly translated. It was, um, yeah, a really different experience for us, I think. In actually, terms yeah, of that's practice. a good point, actually. It's translated into Venetian, not Italian. Yeah. Um, and they're quite, uh, well, certainly the person or the person that was running the home where we were staying was quite keen that that happened, yeah. Um, and had quite an affinity with the Welsh language, the, the idea of trying to be an independent. There's a lot of call in Venice amongst people to be an independent country. Mm. Um, moving on. Okay, I'm going to play this for a little, for a minute before I talk, I think. So this was, um, I'll just say what it is. This was um, Viscos Architecture, which was in Mission Gallery not long after we got back from Venice, actually. leave that play in it's been not much longer um so this architecture um is about the viscosity of air between or people really shouldn't say air it's about the viscosity of 
people and crowds between buildings. Um, one of the things we were looking at before we went to Venice, and it kind of really, um, after the discussions we had with the, the people living in the homeless shelter and various other people there, we um, became, and Venice is such a narrow city, so the spaces are so small and then they open up and, um, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, we became interested in the idea that um, buildings had the same effect on people that riverbanks um, and structures have on water. And so um, the viscosity of water changes uh, depending on where it is against a, a riverbank, for example. So it flows faster uh, away from the, the banks. Does it slow down? So do people slow down closer to buildings? Do they speed up as they get further away from them? And so does that affect, um, is, is that true? I mean, does that happen? We started to draw up these spaces. These spaces uh, were a combination of people's feelings in Venice. Um, and so all of the shapes that you can see there um, represented um, a body of people's specific feeling. So there was a, a number of them that we collected from different people. Um, and this architecture lasted about 10 weeks and it was in four phases. Um, the video that, that the, so the, the lights changing in the, the shapes is um, it's a, it's a film of, of just where the, the house is. Um, it's right on, on the right on the lagoon up in that corner. And um, and so we, we filmed uh, one clear day. Um, a time lapse. That's the word I was trying to think of. And the <laughs> time lapse from um, from dawn pretty much until dusk. And then we kind of compressed that into uh, time and um it's split up into individual um, LED strips. Um, yes. Each one is then put, it's kind of like a TV being yeah. split up into 12 or 13 different lines. And then each line is put into one of the shapes. And so it's a combination of that. Um, okay. So, I mean, they, so that's, I think that's phase three. So in phase three things, so the second phase, they moved out from the center and the third phase, they moved out again. Um, and then in the fourth phase, everything in there was quite chaotic. Uh, there's some installation images on the, the right there. Um, yeah, so we were kind of really keen to, um, to change the familiarity that people have with the space. So really starting to think about how um, we can challenge the space that we are um, putting work into or that we're working within um, and what is traditionally like a kind of, uh, well, mission gallery for anyone that doesn't know it's, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful building um, and it's got a really massive high ceiling and, you know, gorgeous building, but really, sort of playing with that. So taking that away, I guess, from people by lowering the ceiling to, what was it? Seven, uh, foot. seven, seven foot. So kind of, um, yeah, not not very much room underneath um, and really making that space much more um, compressed, I guess, but more sort of reflective of the feeling of being in Venice um, and also like, taking that away from you. So um, asking you to think about the architecture of, the gallery space as well as the actual show changing that up that idea of what you expect to be there when yeah. you get there a bit again um i mean a huge help from ivian porter well, yeah we definitely couldn't have done it it was i mean in hindsight it was a ridiculous thing to do i think we were like seven days at 16 hours a day to and, get it done and dave phillips and dave phillips absolutely so yeah but um Again, just about changing, like I said, about changing the shape, changing things so that they may not be quite what's expected when you get there. Um, this is a really short clip, but I'll play it anyway. <laughs> So this was uh, a <laughs> really short because someone did it on his, I don't even know who someone's took it, Instagram, someone's Instagram yeah. of it. We didn't manage to document it uh, very well. Um, yeah. Um, so this was a, a, 
a performance that we did in uh, Cardiff for Tactile Bosch in uh, the Lost Vegas Hotel on St. Mary Street. Um, it was a projection map into a cupboard um, with live synthesizers um, and a soundtrack that we had written in collaboration with um, Amy from uh, Gosh Girl in Cardiff, who um, she supplied us performer. Some of her uh, models and some of her outfits we used for the, the models to uh, perform in. Um, that was, uh, I suppose, uh, the f- one of the first times. It was a Friday night and on St. Mary Street. It wasn't, it was in a kind of a setup or a new space. It wasn't a gallery. It was in this kind of um, old... Uh, it was a casino. Casino, think, yeah. yeah. So a lot of... Yeah. And and there were bouncers on the door. And for all the world, it looked like... From outside, it looked like a nightclub. There was a DJ in the front room. Um, but when you went past the front room, you kind of went into this bizarre space um, where we were performing a- along with a lot of other people. But it was... Uh, yeah, one of the first times I think that we had genuinely surprised the audience. I think, not, um, not always in a good way. I think. Yeah, I think it's the first time we had experienced while performing um, such a mixed audience. So from like a, a hen party to like people that had come to see an art event. Um, yeah. So it was really that kind of mixed, um, and I think benefited from being so diverse it was the, the atmosphere was slightly different to um to, a, to an art performance event i guess so we did this like a 40 minute uh performance where we'd made these um heads out of foam uh, which you can see there and gloves out of foam and they were all connected with string and it was, seemed like a great idea until we had to play live <laughs> yeah and we couldn't see anything or use our hands. Or use our hands properly. Or, or hear, hear or hear anything properly. Because although not being able to see wasn't so bad, we knew that was going to happen, um, and we could see enough of of the synthesizers to be able to do it. But what we hadn't accounted for really was not being able to hear properly. There was the, enough, the so noise, much insulation yeah. around our ears that we couldn't really hear what was going and on. And the noise level as well outside, kind of rehearsing in the studio, is not the same. So. Yeah, we d- we haven't done that again since. No. <laughs> so. Okay. Um, we came across this piece of work today. <laughs> I just <laughs> forgot about it um, because it's it it's a uh, it's a paper. It's a it's an academic paper that we wrote um, and performed. Um, and for some reason, it's just kind of gone out of the out of my mind as being a, a piece of work, as a piece of artwork. But yeah. actually, it, it is, um, and it's something we did um, while doing our PhD research. Um, we wrote this paper in an attempt to engage this academic audience uh, in a more immersive way. Um, so we were asked to deliver this paper, and we thought, how can we do it in a way that um, well, make it a bit more fun, but also um, get across some of the points that we were trying to make in the paper. So we haven't, I, mean, I wouldn't subject you to the, the actual paper. <laughs> no. Um, but we have got a bit of the, I won't play it all because it's about 13 minutes long. So I won't play it all, but I'll play the beginning because it kind of sets out um, what was happening. And then I'll tell, talk a bit more about it afterwards. Yeah.
stop it there. It doesn't do anything different for the next 13 minutes. Um, yeah, the, the, the paper was um, about, like it says at the bottom there, the potential of risk and failure in a post-digital age. Um, and very much about the production of um, what was a catastrophe or deemed as a, a catastrophe. Um, so we found this uh, website where you can track all of the pieces of space debris that are spinning around the world at any time. Um, and you can choose which pieces you want to look for. So uh, essentially, we took the pieces from both of those satellites that have collided. Um, and this is them as they pass across a line of longitude. Um, so we chose a line of longitude where we are and um, essentially mapped everything and then play. And then they, they are um, transcribed as a score into um, uh, music software and they play certain notes and certain things uh, depending on what where the piece of um, satellite passes over us. Anything you want to add to that? The popping candy. Oh yeah, so I, thought, yeah, I should say that really. Isn't it? <laughs> what that other? So at the at the beginning, the instructions we'd given everyone at the um, at the symposium a little plastic bag that looked for all the world like a packet of drugs, um, and in it was uh, like a small amount of popping candy, um, and we asked everyone to. Put the popping candy as you saw in the, the beginning of the video so to put the popping candy on their tongue at the beginning so when the um the satellite images start to, to move across and there's this i guess for us it's about trying to make the experience more visceral um um more immersive more than just a talk more about being able to feel the type of thing that we're talking about um whether that uh succeeded or not i'm not sure um lots, yeah. of, lots of people didn't do it yeah it was weird we weren't expecting so many people to not eat it but i guess um yeah not everyone no. wants to eat what they don't like no. what they don't trust um but uh yeah the idea of uh kind of the collision that was happening uh and the chaos that we were talking about sort of being uh reflected in what was going on on your tongue i guess um but yeah uh, while listening to us ramble on, ramble on about <laughs> yeah delusion theory yeah um so this is um i'm not going to say loads by this work that this is a um, piece of work that was uh, on High Street um, in 211, uh, just down from Elysium. Um, and it was a two-room uh, two room video installation. Um, the first room was set up with um, a Mylar screen, which is what you can see on the left. And the back room was a more traditional kind of white screen space, and they worked together. Uh, you could move between the two spaces and so the um, video took you from one space to the next and then back into the old space. I think I'll just play. So this is about 40 minutes as well as a um, much shorter piece in the back with the uh, the more kind of dance inspired sounds and video, um, a much more kind of, um, I'm going to say tranquil, I'm not sure it's tranquil, but um, more abstract kind of area in the front where the people in the room can see themselves in the reflection of the mylar, but you can also see through the mylar as well. I'm not sure it comes quite so great in that video. Um, but yeah, there's stuff behind it that you can see. So you can see you, you can see what's being projected onto the wall. You can see what's behind the wall and what's behind you all at the same time. Um, 
And really it was, a, I mean, it was in response to something. It was in response to a, another project that we'd been doing. Um, and it was really about creating that kind of immersive space um, that people could journey through. Um, so this next piece um, was made pretty recently, uh, made um, in the beginning of the last lockdown. Um, I think I'll play it first. It's, it's six minutes long, so I think I think we got we got time really. I think we'll probably play it all, yeah. um, and then you get a break from listening to me talking. As well. <laughs>
Okay. Back so, room. Yeah, <laughs> we're back. Okay, so this is uh, this video is called The Remedy. It will agree with how we feel, um, which was a work made uh, during lockdown for two meters squared space um, online gallery based in Cardiff, but they're an online gallery. Um, and it was made in response to uh, a tweet by a guy called Robert Klemko. Um, four weeks after the, the schools in the US were ordered to be closed in an attempt to uh, sort of um, combat the pandemic. Uh, so it was the 13th of April uh, in 2020. Um, and he claimed that March 2020 was the first March in 18 years without a school shooting in North America. Um, meanwhile, uh, March was also being reported in the news as uh, being the second, the second busiest month for gun sales in American history. So we were kind of making this, this work from within the small space that we were living at the time or small space that we do live. Um, and kind of thinking about what, um, what can be produced from home. So what, what we were producing from home and what, like what we could produce from where we were. So trying to gather as much information as we can. So kind of uh, finding out crime statistics from uh, American government sites, um, location data using Google Maps, so kind of dropping ourselves within to the places that these school shootings had happened, um, looking at 3D printing plans and, and repurposing video. Um, and yeah, like sort of like looking at the idea of what can be made from uh, from within one space. From within the home. Yeah. So printing guns from home, um, and the idea of the, all of the kind of like we said, the shooting statistics in America, um, all of the places in the video are all uh, locations of shootings, uh, school shootings uh, in America. Um, access through Google Maps, like Becky said, that's the only place, only way we could get any material was just by um, getting hold of um, Google Maps, YouTube, uh, stock photography, stock imagery, and that kind of thing. But the idea that all of that is available to anybody um, yeah. just from their computer. Yeah, so, yeah. let's run on because we're going to... Let me talk briefly about this. Okay. Okay, yeah. yeah, so we'll just so, talk... Yeah, we'll just I'll play first. This is um, really recent. This was a piece of work we did in January. Uh, just gone for... Um, uh, Art Shell in Cardiff. We were working in Grangetown with Art Shell. Um, and we had been doing so for a few months, actually. The idea was that it would be a live performance in Grangetown. Um, there were a few other artists doing it as well. Um, but that never happened. Um, and we, I say unfortunately, but we made the best of the situation, I guess, um, had to do it. Uh, live, we live streamed it from uh, from our studio. Is my mouse gone? So I'll just. Um, so that was for the 80th anniversary, anniversary com uh, commemorating, commemorating eight yeah. years since the, uh, the, blitz, the blitz in, in, in Grangetown. In Grangetown. Yeah. Um, and we did a lot of digging in the Glamorgan archives. Um, we were supposed to be talking to uh, residents. We did a bit, but then we got back into lockdown and all kinds of stuff 
happening. But uh, a lot of the sounds and the Morse code, I think, are based on a set of letters that were written by um, a woman around that area at that time and also one of the residents of the street who still lives there. Um, there you go. Okay. Right. right. So, I mean, I guess trancy 90s style techno um yeah, maybe um maybe not i mean I, it, hopefully maybe sometimes um i don't know does it matter uh why why do we need to be put into a category why is it easier for people to understand um i'm not sure this is uh a short clip from the video that is supposedly 90s uh, transy techno. So video um, and all of that, we, I mean, we played it live, uh, the video sound recording, mixing and all of that stuff is um, by someone else and not our video at all, but our performance. Um, and so to where we are now, um, I'm amazed how well we've timed this actually. <laughs> um, so we are kind of, still on that journey i think what we said at the beginning this the idea of algorithms and categorization is really really interesting to us um and at the moment we're fortunate enough to be working with ado um on a mentoring program as it says exploring new ways to creatively engage in the public realm uh, with a particular interest in working within this no man's land between the perceived conflicting binary factions of high and popular culture so that's kind of where we see ourselves where we see our work developing um and so like i said this op this opportunity to be meant to be mentored by ado helps us to negotiate this nomadic space and to discover pathways from both sides that facilitate the cultural acceptance and potential of such contested and uncertain space um uh, in plain english that means that we are trying to negotiate that kind of area where we we are uncertain what we're doing um, maybe other people are uncertain about what we're doing and that's kind of the point um so we're making a series of um large-scale interactive short films um that utilize a combination of lots of the stuff that we've learned so lots of the things that you've seen in the other work um, we utilize a lot of those methods um to exist in that kind of space and uh, that hopefully will encourage engagement for a, from a, a more varied audience or a wider audience whatever you want to call it really um and that's kind of where we are yeah i mean it, we're we're a long way down the road with it we've done quite a lot of work on it we're working on some technology and stuff that is new to us um yeah it's exciting it's exciting that's it. Yeah. Okay.